Social stratification is an aspect of the wider issue of social inequality. The existence of socially created inequalities is a feature of all known human societies and therefore it is an important subject for sociologists to discuss. The chapter attempts to handle the many difficulties which emerged in the analysis of caste. In fact, the literature on the subject has created more doubts than clarity. One finds a lack of distinction between Rama and Jati, while different perspectives develop one aspect of analysis at the cost of the other. Conjectural theories too have not been absent, particularly in the writings of the colonial ethnographers who continue to be used today to substantiate evidence. Several analysts popularized the view of Indian society as a caste society, ignoring the dynamics of existing conditions. They perceived caste to be logical opposite of the class system, which was associated along with individualism and particularly with the West. Types of social stratification Broadly speaking, the following types of social stratifications have been known to exist. One, the age set system, 2. Slave system, 3. Estate system, 4. Caste system, 5. Class system, and 6. Race or ethnic system. Caste system. The typical characteristics of the caste systems are 1. The membership is hereditary and fixed for life. 2. Each caste is an endogamous group. 3. Social distance is encouraged by the restriction of contacts and commensality with members of other castes. 4. Caste consciousness is stressed by caste names as well as by conformity to the particular customs of the particular caste. 5. Occupational specialization. The system is rationalized by religious belief. Caste operates at two levels. Firstly, in terms of an abstract classification into four types of Varna, Brahmin, which are priests, Kshatriya, Lungs, Vaishya, Merchants, Arid, Shudra, as workers. Secondly, at the operational village level, there is a division of local communities into groupings called Jati. The rigidity of this system is unchangeable. Marginal upward social mobility is possible by a process called Sanskritization. In this process, members of a lower caste adopt the manners and customs of a higher caste and sever their ties with their original caste. Individual features of the caste system can be observed in other societies which follow strict segregation of particular groups. But caste system in its entirety is of course found in India and outside India among Hindus, settled abroad and within India among non-Hindu groups. The stronghold of caste and the trends toward change in its nature and functioning have affected the pattern of social stratification in India. You will learn about this process in ESO 40. Class system The class system is very different from system of stratification we have so far discussed. Social classes are neither legally defined nor religiously sanctioned groups. Rather, these are relatively open groups which have been considered to be by the products of process of industrialization and urbanization throughout the world in all modern industrial societies. The class system of social stratification basically implies a social hierarchy based primarily upon differences in wealth and income. These differences are expressed in different lifestyles and hence different consumption patterns. In some cases, we also find different manners in terms of speech and dress. As a general type, class systems are characterized by social mobility upward and downward, both intergenerational and intragenerational. 
In studying the concept of class, we face two questions. Firstly, what criteria should be used to identify classes? Secondly, there is the subjective element that is, do people with identical tangible material assets form a class even if they are not perceived by others and themselves as a conscious class? Yes, on the first problem of the criteria, according to Max Weber, the dimension of wealth, power and lifestyle are crucial in determining the class. Most sociologists generally use several criteria simultaneously in determining the class. For the second subjective problem, it is generally agreed that the issue of class consciousness should not be introduced as a definition of class itself. Generally, most socialists agree that in all industrial societies, we find the existence of the upper, middle and working classes. Similarly, in agrarian societies, a noted sociologist Daniel Thorner has identified three classes in the rural countryside in India. These he called the classes of Malik, Kisan and Mazdoor, that is, the proprietors who own the land, the working peasants who own the small amount of land and the labor class of Mazdoor who did not own any land but work on the other people's land. Basic Features of Caste Model Andrew Beetle has outlined the basic features of this perspective, the caste model of Indian society while examining its usefulness as a scheme of analysis. The features of the caste model are 1. It is based on the ideas held and expressed by certain sections of the people and not on observed behavior, although secondary empirical material have been used. 2. It attaches kind of primary and universal significance to caste in India as this has been conceived in the classical texts. 3. The entire system is viewed as being governed by certain more or less explicitly formulated principles or rules of the game. 4. The different castes which are the basic units in the system are conceived as fulfilling complementary functions and their mutual relations are seen as being non-antagonistic. Andre Beaton points out two dangers emanating from this model. Firstly, that it is so general a theory that it can actually be applied to any society and secondly, it fails to take into account the details of economic and political life. Beaton observes that the caste model associated primarily with the work of Louis Dumont has been found useful in the interpretation of beliefs relating to Hinduism. He considers the study of interests equally important in the understanding of political and economic problems and his analysis of caste in a Tanjore village is a good example of such a concern. Yogin Singh's work has attempted to understand change where class factors operate within the framework of caste categories with a new sense of identity. In such events, caste violations also occur pointing to contradictions which were not visible earlier. Yaman Srinivas' concept of Sanskritization in one such dominant process of change in the caste system. Sanskritization could be observed in terms of specific context in which it occurs and secondly as a historical process of change in the caste system as a whole. Another process of cultural change described by Srinivas is called Westernization. It brings about the change in values, norms and vary the cultural groups of people. Yogendra Singh sees these to have implications for structural changes in the caste system, in particular in India, society in general, epitomized as revolt against hierarchy or capture the modernization process. Structural changes. These structural changes appear as land reforms, the spread of education, social legislation, democratization, industrialization and urbanization. 
The effect of these on caste system is that often adaptive mechanisms such as caste association appear as mechanism of social mobilization. These organizations strive mainly for the fulfillment of materialistic and mundane goals for their members, thereby making them more aware of their deprivation and structural impediments. These associations are often concerned with non-caste like functions but they are not classes since members range across several class situations. Intra-caste contradictions are not allowed to come up and this may also create a notion of shared deprivation and class consciousness. Economic Relations The caste system has also been considered to be a system of economic relations. John Melcher writes that for those at the bottom, the caste system has worked as a very systematic tool of exploitation and oppression. One of the functions of the system has been prevent the formation of classes with any commonality of interest, of unity of purpose. Melchior have used class in the Marxian sense and adopted the Marxian model to analyze caste relations. As such, caste is a system of exploitation rather than a system of interdependence and reciprocity. Caste stratification has been a deterrent to the development of class conflict or proletarian consciousness. This is because caste, the most crucial point for consideration is that classes are not found as a system of stratification in the same way as castes are entrenched in Indian society. Further, that most of the problems created by the caste system are still of a class nature related to economic domination and subjugation, privileges and deprivations, conspicuous waste and base survival. These problems are essentially those of the privileged and disprivileged and one cannot locate these as concrete groupings in a strictly Marxian sense as class antagonism, class consciousness and class unity are not present. Thus, India's situation is very different from other societies in the sense that the problems are of a class nature but classes as a division of society are not found as concrete socio-economic units. Power and Dominant Caste Andrew Beaton observes that the power has shifted from one dominant caste to another and it, it is shifted from caste structure itself and come to be located in more differentiated structures such as panchayats and political parties. Yet, Beaton does not reflect upon the consciousness of this shift can we study change in caste structure without examining the consequent patterns of distributive justice or equality or inequality? If we cannot analyze the flexibility inherent in the norms of an egalitarian system, it would be difficult to interpret the emergence of formal institutions and structures as the indicators of a shift from caste areas to caste free structures. Even if a caste as a whole is not a dominant and the dominant group comprises families of several castes, it does not mean that the magnitude of the inequality has substantially reduced. Caste class nexus. My observation is that the change is from one kind of structure of inequality to another. Earlier, also, caste was characterized by intercaste differentiation of roles as well as differentiation within particular caste. Thus, differentiation is not necessarily related to reduction of caste inequalities. Differentiation of roles may bring about certain new inequalities which might strengthen the existing ones, and in such situation, differentiation becomes a double-edged weapon for the lowest groups in a caste system or for the matter in any type of system. We have a few proletarian zamindars or landlords on one hand and also neo-rich, neo-influential, neo-zamindars on others as a result of emergence of new structures in the village community. 
Synchronic analysis studies on caste have paved the way to certain field work tradition which produced synchronic analysis. The emphasis had been on presenting caste as an equilibrating, harmonic, stable, and consensual system. Change was often presented as a shifted in relations from organic to sedimentary, close to open, harmonic to disharmonic. Yet, Empirical evidences seem to suggest that change in the caste system has been adaptive evolutionary. Changes in the caste system can be analyzed from one structure of inequality and hierarchy to another structure of inequality. To understand this problem of change in the caste system, we should analyze the composite status of people of a given society either taking family or individuals as a unit of analysis of or both. Such an approach calls for the consideration of caste as a dynamic process, hence we need methodology for the understanding of the process of transformation. It is in this context that I will now discuss the caste class nexus. Both caste and class have been debated from narrow ideological standpoints. According to the caste model perspective, caste is viewed as an overreaching ideological system encompassing all aspects of social life of Hindu in particular and of other communities in general. One of the implications of such a view is that the caste is basically a part of the infrastructure of Indian society. Thus, occupation, division of labor, Rules of marriage, interpersonal relations are element of superstructure expressing the reproduction of the ideology of caste. Caste as a system. Following from this, we ask a question. In what way is caste a normative system? Why in certain spheres caste adheres to its normative sanctions whereas in other domains, caste groups and their members have taken up activities which depart from traditional sanctions of the caste system. It may be noted that members of the caste compete with each other, but they also cooperate with one another. Class-based distinctions within the caste have always been formed in a pronounced form. Members of a caste in a given village can sometimes be representatives of Indian class divisions for a while observing all the pertinent rules of marriage, they may actually define pertinent negotiations along the axis of class conditions. Both caste and class have been debated from narrow ideological standpoints. According to the caste model perspective, caste is viewed as an overarching ideological system encompassing all aspects of social life of Hindus in particular and of the communities in general. One of the implications of such view is that the caste is basically a part of infrastructure of Indian society. Thus, occupation division of labor, rules of marriage, interpersonal relations are elements of superstructure expressing the reproduction of the ideology of the caste. Caste and mobility. Although the caste is not really a very flexible system, yet a caste permits mobility in a certain areas to its members. A given caste and guided by the norms of the caste system regarding inter-caste dependence. However, any given caste has also its autonomy with regard to the observance of its practices, rituals and rights in relation to other castes. Srinivas notes that even today agricultural production requires cooperation of several castes. The use of the caste idiom is quite widespread. From 1966, Marx related the Asiatic mode of production to the stability of the caste system in India. Waiter blames Dumont in particular for encouraging a caste view of Indian society. Such a caste model, according to Waiter, does not provide an analysis of material interests along with the study of ideas and values. There is a dialectical relationship between the two and Dumont and Pro 
Pocock's notion of binary opposition is far from the notion of dialectics as given by Marx. Beaton also suggests that economic and political conflicts occur with a certain degree of autonomy of their own, hence they could be studied independent of caste and religious beliefs and ideas. The caste model would not permit such a path of understanding. Edmund Leach's understanding that cooperation refers to caste and competition refers to class is naive and unconvincing. Not only families and dominant castes compete with each other to extend patronage to the lower caste for maintaining their dominance, but the lower caste families too compete to seek favors from the families of the dominant castes. Such competition is really not a new phenomenon. Even feuds due to conflicting claims on territory were quite common among the Kshatriyas and Brahmins for seeking power in ancient and medieval India. Leeds view that caste was merely caste and a class-like situation emerged only when the patterns started competing with each other ignores the fact that inter-caste conflicts and rewards by lower castes against the upper castes have been historical fact. Explaining Class Marxist notions of class and class conflict have become hallmarks of the studies of Indian agricultural and urban industrial structures. Marx himself discussed caste and the traditional ethos of village communities in his two articles on India. Initially, Marx characterized the Asiatic mode of production as an absence of private property in land and the static nature of economy due to a certain tie-up between caste, agriculture and village handicrafts. However, C. T. Kuyen observes that the analysis of Asiatic mode does not deny the role of class contradictions and class structures. India's pre-capitalist economic formation was based on both caste and class side by side. Two questions are relevant for a discussion on a class. One, what method can be used for analyzing the class structure in Indian society? And two, what is the class caste nexus and its ramification and interrelation in each region? The purpose of discussing these questions is not to accept or reject the Marxian approach, but to see what useful insights it provides to us. Ashok Rudra, while analyzing the class composition of Indian agricultural population, observes that there are only two classes in Indian agriculture. One, the big landlords and two, the agricultural laborers. These two classes are in antagonistic relationship with each other and this constitutes the principal contradiction in Indian rural society. Similar to Rudra's view in is that held by A.R. Desai of 1975. Rudra empathically argues that Indian agriculture has capitalist relationship and capitalist development. Hence, there are two classes, haves and have-nots. The state in India has assumed the norms of capitalist society as the axis of its development strategy. One of the implications of this formulation is that the frame of reference which applies to the rest of the world also applies very well to the Indian society. The other inference is that dominant variable for analysis of Indian society is the economic in its situation and context. In India, V. M. Dandekar observes the strikes by wage earners is a very common feature and they include those earnings from 200 rupees to those who have salaries up to several thousands. Hence, wage earners must be seen as a heterogeneous category. About three-fourths of work forces are left out by the Marxian yardsticks. The Indian state being a welfare state is the largest employer today. 
is the indian slate a capitalist exploitative and oppressive agency just like an industrialist or the employer of wage earners about 10 million workers are engaged in small industries and family owned concerns and these workers generally do not witness class antagonism and strikes the organized labor is one ninth of the total workforce can we accept the marxian approach overlapping of class caste and occupation allied conflict pressure groups and factions influence of middle classes and prevalence of mixed classes and gentleman farmers are some of the important elements to be taken into account for a serious analysis of india's class structure the judge money system too can be explained in terms of class relations and the mode of production let us now look at caste hierarchy and occupation conclusion the structural aspects of caste namely economic and political dimensions have remained underestimated so also analysis of cultural aspect of social stratification can provide a deeper understanding of indian social formation since the two are in fact inseparable from each other as we have noted classes functions within the context of castes caste conflicts are also class or agrarian conflicts the rifts between the upper and the lower castes to a large extent correspond with conflicts between landowners and share croppers or agricultural laborers four basic points for understanding of caste and class relations and their transformation may be noted these are one dialectics to history three culture and four structure dialectics do not simply refer to a binary fusion in the cognitive structure of the society it refers to effective notions which being about contradictions and highlights relationship between unequal segments and men and women history is not conjectural based on mythology scriptures and idealistic constructions but it provides a substantial account of existent conditions of work and relationships culture does not include just cultural practices rituals rites of passage etc it defines the rules of game the nature of relations between the privileged and the deprived and modes of resistance of consensus structure is no doubt a product of dialectic contradictions historical forces and certain rules of game but it becomes formation once it has emerged and in return becomes a sort of force to determine in some way the course of history thus structure refers to relations between social segments as a point of time but more as a historical product and reality having these elements as a kernel of structural historical approach changes in caste and class structure could be considered as transformation process the following processes of structural changes emanating from the above paradigmatic explanations may be noted one downward mobility two upward mobility three urban income for rural people and mobility in the village four rural non agricultural income and mobility these are themes which require much attention if we are to achieve a more complete understanding of caste and a class in india